Okay. So, are we uh, good over there? Okay, good. Well, all right. Well, welcome to everybody here to our panel about slaying the two-headed beast, the challenges and triumphs of DNSSEC. So, as we just mentioned, okay, we've got some microphones here. That's good. We like to have that for our guests. We, uh, this is part of the Deploy360 program. As we mentioned before, we have a number of different parts of this, the web portal, social media, and other pieces, and we're active on social media. Our panel today, I'm going to ask them to briefly introduce themselves, and then we're going to get into a series of questions that we have. Uh, my name is Dan York. I work with the Internet Society Deploy360 program. I've been involved in security and Internet issues for a very long time. And my particular focus within the Internet Society is around this topic of DNSSEC and DNS security. So let me turn it now to maybe Frederick, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hello. So my name is Frederick. I'm working on uh, StatDNS, which is a DNS research project. Um, we are producing uh, deployment statistics about uh, IPv6 and DNSSEC within the GTLDs. We're also producing some open source DNS tools. Uh, one of which is used to power multi-location DNS looking glass, which can be used to make uh, DNS requests over HTTP, and uh, used to troubleshoot uh, DNS propagation, anycast DNS deployments, and uh, GeoDNS as well. Uh, regarding uh, DNSSEC, I'm also a user of this technology. On the authoritative side, I've signed some domains. I'm also experimenting with Dane, which which should really push further. Uh, so I've then deployed on one of StatDNS domains, and also of course on the resolving sign, uh, both on servers and uh, at home. And that's it. Great, uh, Crystal. Good afternoon. My name is Krzysztof Olesik. I'm DNS technical team manager at at NASC. I'm responsible for the technical operations of .pl registry. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Wallström. I work for .sc and the OpenDNS company. Uh, .sc was one of the first, uh, the first TLD to be signed with DNSSEC uh, six months after the standard was finalized. And we have discovered a, a huge number of bugs and being the first player in the field is uh, problematic, so, but we learned a lot from it. Okay, well, so we've got a group of people out here, here at a network operators group. Let's maybe start with the basics of why should folks here care? What does DNSSEC do? I can start with that. Um, DNSSEC is uh, the only way to secure DNS. DNS has, over the years, shown bug after bug with security issues and being vulnerable to different kind of cache, uh, cache bugs where you can inject false information in the DNS. So, so the only real solution to that is DNSSEC. There has been a uh, balance between fixing the bugs in DNS and the number of bugs that has been shown. So uh, this is only working so far. I mean, in 2008, the Kaminsky bug was shown, and that was the day that uh, the public was really considering DNSSEC for the first time and the management actually understood why, why they want to protect their business by, by actually deploying DNSSEC. But since then, the, the, those bugs have been kind of fixed, but there's a new one coming all the time. Well, maybe that's a question, though, is, is how real are the threats to the DNSSEC you know, solves? How, what, do people really need to be concerned? Well, if, if you're on an insecure network, you don't know where your DNS information comes from. So that's the problem that the DNSSEC solves for you, if you run a DNSSEC resolver on your laptop, of course. Okay, any, Frederick or Christoph, any? Uh, DNS is a huge uh, database which stores many critical information for us. So bringing a trust into DNS is of, of, it's of a high importance. So the DNSSEC, I would say, is a must. Okay. So maybe let's start talk a little bit about, you know, when we think about DNSSEC, there's different parts to it, right? There's signing and validating. Can one of you maybe talk about what are those parts? Uh, yeah, I think we have to, to mention, so we are using public key cryptography to sign DNS, uh, DNS data. 
So in practice, so like on the authoritative side, you uh, save your zone with additional signatures for each uh, with three chord sets. And on the resolving side, you use a validating DNS recursor, which will fetch the DNS data and the digital signature and the public key, which you will use to verify that this data is authentic, uh, authentic and has not been uh, tampered with or altered in any way. Yeah, I, I, I'll show a little slide I put up here that just shows on, there's a signing side and there's a validating side. And those are really the two different parts that we're talking about here. Part of it is signing the domains and then the other part is the actual validation of those domains. Maybe uh, looking at Patrick, I know you folks have been doing a lot on the signing side, certainly. And maybe you could talk a bit about what the Open DNSSEC project is all about or what it does. Right. Uh, when we started with the Open DNSSEC project, there was no real good signing software out there. Uh, what we did in .sc was basically doing it by hand almost. Uh, so, so what we wanted to do was making things like signing and key rollovers and everything automatic and, and being done by a policy that you want for your zone or zones. So, so we also wanted to do it in a very secure way by protecting the keys in a very good fashion. Most of the deployment that was done back, th back then was using uh, keys on disk unprotected. So mm -hmm. if, if you had a break in, your keys would uh, disappear or end yeah. up in the wrong hands. So you helped auto automate a lot of that. So we did a lot of work on that and integrating with the secure keys. How about you guys? Well. What are you doing to kind of automate that or, or the signing side of it? Do you work with that or are you more in the validation? On the uh, authoritative side, I'm not automatic, uh, automating, uh, automating, sorry, anything because I use some zones which are my 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 zone data is not changing a lot. So I mean, I don't have to resign all the time, right. and I'm using uh, offline signing, which works for me in this case. In this case, that's a good point because for enterprises or others who don't, or you know, zones that don't change the need to have automated re-signing is not as critical. It's still, it just means it's more of a manual process when you go to re-sign re that. Automated signing obviously makes that better and, and makes sure it happens. But the key point is that when you do change your DNS zone, it has to be re-signed in some way. Christoph, how about you? Any? Oh, we do re-sign the zone three times a day uh -huh. because uh, we use, uh, we work in a mixed model. We use a dynamic updates, and we also have a full export of DNS uh, da uh, data into, into DNS system. So we, we have to resign the zones three times a day. But uh, the, the, the system is uh, fully automa automatic. With the DNSSEC, we have to, do, we have to remember about, uh, about the generation of keys, and, uh, and then pa remember about the publication of DS resource record at root. So, all the system is automated. Mm -hmm. We used uh, a scripts, uh, a custom the, the developed scripts and the tools pro provided with the DNS software. So this was mostly this was your own script you developed along with some of the tools that are, that are provided with the DNS server software. Uh, uh, we used tools uh, prov pro prov provided uh, by the by the develop developer of the DNS software, but we uh, we write uh, wrappers f f for the scripts to to, to make it uh, more automated process. Okay, well, you know what are some of the benefits? I mean, what can DNSSEC offer people beyond obviously the security of that? What else can it why should somebody get involved with this? Why are we here? Well, in, in the web browser, for example, you trust your DNS, and in theory, you can tr also begin to trust the keys that you use for SSL se uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. So if you put those keys in DNS, you have an automatic trust uh, in, in the root of the DNS, as well as the certificate served from the web browser. So in, in combination, you, you can really trust the website. So that raises a good question. Why can't I just trust that fancy extended validation SSL certificate that I bought? Why can't I just trust? I've got that. Why do I need DNSSEC? In, in SSL, you have like 200 or more SSL routes. And you trust all of them. And you don't even know who they are. So, so that, what, that could be a problem. If so what you, you're saying is somebody could spoof my certificate? Yes. Is that easy? 
Well, if, if you have control over a CA, mm. if you're not the government, has, has it, there been, it is possible. Have there been mistakes like that happened? A couple. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, hmm, funny about that. There, there's the other basic detail, right, that in order to get that certificate, they have to get to your web server. So if somebody hijacks the DNS and points it to somebody else's site, it doesn't matter what certificate you have, right? Well, uh, you can have multiple trust paths, so mm. you can still trust the CA as well as DNS and the third party if you are one of those paranoid guys. So what we're talking about here is a part of DNSSEC called Dane, or it's an extension to it, RFC 6698, which is a way to store certificates or fingerprints of certificates into, uh, into DNS and then have DNSSEC ensure that. Frederick, you mentioned you've been experimenting a bit with Dane. What are you doing with it? I simply deployed it uh, with a CA signed certificate in order to make sure a certificate is not spoofed or mm -hmm. like there we have maybe to mention uh, with SSL you are only guaranteeing that uh, the endpoint you are connecting to will be encrypted but you have actually no guarantee that the endpoint you are connecting to is the one you want to wish. Right. There could be man in the middle attacks and that's why with Dane you uh, publishing fingerprint of your SSL certificate to ensure that the endpoint is actually the one you you want to wish, you, or, you, or you want your user, users to wish. Actually, yes, yeah, so you, you, that you're using the correct certificate too. Uh, any more thoughts on Dane? What else have you done with it? Yeah, when uh, when Dane hits web browsers, when they can actually consume DNSSEC and TLSA uh, records in DNS the packets in DNS will grow so big that most, still, still most home gateways, your home routers will not do your big DNS packets for you. That is still a problem. That's why we work in the home networking group in ITF to actually fix and make it possible for, for the web browsers to have this extra security. Sounds good. I, just to, to illustrate this, I have a slide that I'll throw up here that um, just shows a picture over here and of the typical kind of interaction that you have to go out and find the IP address and then you're connecting to a web server and you're getting back a TLS or an SSL certificate and um, but the question really is how do we know it's the right one and that's what this whole thing with Dane is bringing about is this idea that you could check the uh, you could your, your web browser could check that the certificate that it got from the web server is the same that came down out of DNS through this TLSA record. Now, what other things are people doing with Dane beyond web browsers? The easiest protocol to deploy right now is uh, SNTP and XMPP because that's uh, mostly server-based software so you can actually not be stopped by the home gateways. So XMPP is? It's a Jabber Chat software. Jabber Chat. Yeah. Yes, okay. And what was the other one you said? Uh, SNTP, that's SN email. <laughs> email, all right, there we go. <laughs> so I pull you out of the IETF <laughs> geekisms into the regular language. <laughs> and have you, um, Frederick, have you worked, tried any of those? Or? Uh, on the uh, SMTP side, no. Not yeah. Yet. It's a new thing. I mean, one of the things we've seen is that Dane has this great promise of this extra trust layer in web browsing, but the web browser vendors so far have been a little bit um, reticent, uh, reluctant to go in and, and add Dane in. Uh, part of it is that they say they haven't heard the demand. It's that classic thing that they haven't heard people asking for it. Uh, another part is that it does add an extra bit of validation to go and do the process and the browser vendors right now are incredibly focused around speed has been one of the, the challenges that they've, their, their pushback to us anyway has been around why they haven't done that. But what's interesting though is to Patrick's point, we are seeing people in the, uh, in the email world looking at how to use this. There's some folks um, playing with Dane in the uh, VoIP world looking at how they can use it to better secure uh, SIP endpoints, so IP phones and soft phones and things. I saw that uh, yeah, um, Paul Wooters had put up a couple drafts around how to use it for PGP and for a couple other different kinds of things. So people are trying to experiment with that. Um, on the validation side, switching kind of to the other side of things, when I talk about validating uh, domain names, um, 
what's stopping people from doing validation today? I mean, just, let's back up. What's the process of validation? Could one of you explain that? Validation is to actually look at the digital signatures that DNSSEC adds to DNS and verify those so that it, it can actually be verified from the root down to the record that you asked for. So I, let's, I'll use a signed domain that I happen to know, internetsociety.org. So I'm going to go to www.internetsociety.org. So my web browser tells my DNS server, get me the IP address for www.internetsociety.org. What does a validating DNS server do there? It, it looks at the signature, and then it asks for DNS keys to match those signatures all the way up to the root. And what happens if, it, uh, if the signatures don't match? Uh, the problem with DNSSEC is that you don't have a specific failure mode for DNSSEC. Or, mm -hmm. So you get a serve fail, which is any kind of problem with DNS. Mm -hmm. So you don't know why things break. But from my experience... You don't reach your destination. I don't, make, I don't get there. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> And, and there's been some early adopter challenges with that. There've been, uh, we've had a couple instances. The, the most famous one was the NASA issue where they, NASA let their key signatures lapse and people who were on Comcast network in the United States were unable to get to NASA's website and it immediately happened. It happened to be on the same day that, if you recall, Wikipedia was going dark with all the SOPA, PIPA stuff that was going on in the US. And so it, it became this big conspiracy that everybody thought that uh, you know, something was going on. But it was not. It was an error. It was somebody had made a mistake on that line. But it points to your point about the automation that's needed that you talked about earlier to kind of make some of that happen. But so the validating servers, and I just mentioned one deployment in the United States, um, but I know your country, I know Sweden has a lot of, can you talk about how the resolvers are, are validating there in your country, are most ISPs? Yeah, mo the, the most resolvers are ISPs, so all the big uh, ISPs are doing uh, validating the NSEC right now. So that's, that's been quite easy process. Since we were there from the start, we can actually convince ISPs to, to turn it on. And, and back then, there were basically very few signed domains, right. so you didn't see these errors. But right now, we have one third of the .se zone with signed domains. Hmm. So that has been a slow learning curve for everybody involved. But now most, most of the ISPs are doing validation. And I know that nearby uh, here, I know the Czech Republic um, has also been very, uh, the folks there have been very a active getting their ISPs to sign as well, or not to validate. So we're getting the validation, and this is part of this DNSSEC bootstrapping problem. We need to have DNS resolvers out there that are validating, and then we also need to have domains that are signed. So it's these two different pieces that are there. Um, and you all as network operators who are here, you know, part of what you can do when you go back is look at how to go and, and enable res uh, resolving or validation on your resolvers. Is it hard? No? Okay. You said you should, no. What, what do you have to do? Uh, well, you just have to configure your, your DNS server to is it make a big, validation. Long process? big long process? No, it's just configuration option and uh, eventually you have to make sure to provision enough uh, boxes in order to, because your CPU usage will, of course, go a little bit uh, higher as you are doing validation. Mm, now, you just said a word that some operators might be wondering about, provisioning more boxes. What, what do you mean? I mean, you have to make sure that your server are suffici uh, sufficiently powerful to be able to validate so requests for, for each request. Like, if you have a lot of uh, customers or... So you need some servers to be sure you've got enough capacity. Christophe, you were shaking your head a little bit there. Definitely, you, f you have to cater for uh, uh, CPU that you have to uh, have a, a greater CPU, more RAM, mm -hmm. uh, and definitely uh, a bigger uh, link to the internet. Mm -hmm. Because you're getting more. Because the responses of the NSSEC, you, uh, yes, definitely, uh, you 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 have to fetch more DNS re records to validate uh, 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 a DNS response. And uh, the, respo the responses you send, or you receive, uh, are much, much, much bigger. It's like, uh, you know, four times or five mm -hmm. times bigger. Because you've got the, that the key in there rather than yes. just the, exactly. the single little response. Now, y you implemented DNSSEC under .pl here, right? Yes. So yeah. what was involved with that? 
what was involved in that? Yes, there were several ch challenges. I would divide them into two ca categories, technological one and the operational one. Technology the and technological, operation. Yeah, operational, uh, operation. Uh, uh, from the point of view of technology, we have to learn how to use HSNs. Mm. Uh, it was new to, uh, technology for us. There is uh, a special specification called PKCS 11. It's a um, well, specification for, of the... For people who are out here, yeah. what's an HSM? Oh, I know. It's a hardware security model. It's a, it's a uh, d uh, device um, and designed for storing a cryptographic uh, ma 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 materials in, uh, ma material in a secure manner. So it's uh, tamper-proofed. So it's a, yes, it's a it's box a certified that uh, by special organizations who say, uh, guys, this is re really safe. Right, so it's a, it, it makes sure that those keys are secure and protected. Secure. So you need to exactly. get a couple of those to, to make uh, that work in there. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have to test uh, several d d d devices because uh, we have to make sure that uh, the, the capacity of the device is, is uh, sufficient and uh, DNS software want to talk to the device and they communicate. That was the, the biggest challenge. Okay. And what other challenges you said? Yes. You? And the operational one, uh, uh, when we think about the security, you have to consider who should have access to the keys, uh, how to organize key roll rollovers, uh, there also uh, who should be, who should take, take part in the disaster recovery and prepare all the different stuff of information, communication outside uh, the, the company. It's uh, a lot of things to, to, to be aware of, you know. Mm -hmm. That was a, ch a, ch a challenge too, because we have to produce lots of, lots of documents and engineers don't, 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 don't like to write documents, you know, <laughs> they, they consider it as a, it's a waste of time. <laughs> But now, it, now it's signed, it's yes, operation. Yes, it's signed. Fortunately, it works well. <laughs> we didn't have uh, any accident yet. Good. Yeah. And now, so far, so good. <laughs> and now part of this, though, too, is now that .pl has been signed and, and pieces there, if I want to take my domain that's in .pl and I want to register it, or I want, or I want to sign it, I can sign it, yes. and now I have to somehow let .pl know it's signed. Are, are, you, are you working with the registrars in here? Yes, uh, we've, we've had uh, several meetings with registrars, even in the past years. Uh, first, we've been talking about the DNSSEC, about the technical aspects. We mm -hmm. trained them how to use DNSSEC, what's it for. And uh, this year, we had a meeting with, uh, with our registrars, and the meeting was focused on the benefits of DNSSEC. What will be the, be the, be the benefits for, uh, it, it, about the, for the clients of, of registrars and for, the, for, the, for, for, and, and for them itself? Good. Well, I, I wish you the best with that. That's one of the challenges we've certainly seen in different areas has been to, uh, to encourage the registrars to be able to help with the transmission. There's a key part. They have to take the DNS, the, the key, the, and transfer it up in what's called a DS record. And they have to transfer that up to the top level domain. I know, what, have, what happened in Sweden that, to get registrars using that? Well, the first few years, the first year we actually considered DNSSEC to be in production in 2007, we actually charged extra for publishing a DS record in, in a TLD, oh. which was a failure. We, we want to encourage people to, to secure their domains. So now they turned it upside down. So now it's actually cheaper if you add a DS record. Yeah. So that's how you do. Okay. It, it should be. It should cost extra if you want to do unsecure, insecure DNS. Insecure. So it costs insecure. less to have a more secure domain. I exactly. like that. That's a good. That's a good way to go. If you're a TLD that can do that, it yeah. works. So that has been quite successful, and that's that's the common thing between the TLDs that have a lot of uh, signed domains. That it's cheaper. So the TLD, the, the registry, has done that, which yeah. has then provided a financial incentive for the registrars to go and make that work. Interesting. Yeah. Because the registrars don't do, sh sh uh, earn their money on DNS, they earn it on right. other stuff. Yeah. So that's one way of making it happier. Now, now one question when we talk about that is, uh, you know, on a certain level, shouldn't DNSSEC kind of be transparent to the end users? Do they need to care about it? Or should they be warned about it? What, what do you think about that? Frederick, do you have thoughts on that? 
Yeah, uh, so we must differentiate uh, also rotative side and uh, recursive side. Okay. On the recursive side, I think uh, the answer is probably yes. And we have seen this with, uh, for example, Comcast mm -hmm. turning out DNS seg validation silently. We saw that it didn't really break anything, except that sometimes some failure, like it's a NASA right. one. We've seen also Google public DNS turning on DNSSEC validation, and it was a huge milestone. It, it, was. it was. There was actually so some uh, studies on uh, DNSSEC deployment on uh, resolving side, and we saw that uh, suddenly, like, a bump of people validating, like, were from 3 to 8% or something like that. Do, do people know what, I'm, what, what Frederick's talking about? Google operates its public DNS servers, and just earlier this year, they turned on DNSSEC validation by default. So that anybody who's using Google's public DNS servers now just gets this automatically, transparent to them. And some individuals use Google's public servers. Some ISPs, especially some smaller ones, turn out to use it. We discovered one of the people presenting at one of the conferences um, from APNIC, who was presenting some of his research, discovered that some countries, some large ISPs, turn out to use Google's public DNS servers. Now, whether they continue to with all the current discussions around surveillance and stuff, who knows, but at least there was uh, that, and, and we saw a big jump in the rise of validation. Okay, so that's the validation side. So for, for the end user, it should be transparent. It just works. Yeah, probably. So operators out here, they could just turn it on and it should just work. I mean, the end users don't need to know. Well, this way is a question of what to do in case of a validation failure. Uh, we may ask, like, if it will make sense eventually to validate in an uh, in, uh, in application directly. For example, ah. for web browsers, ah. like what to do, should we allow users to go insecure, just like we do with uh, SSL certificate? In case SSL certificate is expired, you can choose to go yep. to the site. And how many so people here click through those boxes? Right, okay, yeah, it's one of those challenges. But you're, yeah, so allow the users. Patrick, you look like you want to weigh in on this or something. Yeah, um, the hard part of DNS is that users don't know what DNS is. <laughs> but, but if they know what DNS is and they have problems with it, they change their resolver. <laughs> so if they change it from, an, from a secure resolver to an insecure resolver, it probably work. Or it, they are probably under attack. You know, it's, it's, funny, it's hard actually, to tell the difference. Yeah, you're right, because when um, I, I think back to that when Comcast had that issue with NASA, there was immediately a flood of articles out in blogs and such that were being spread around on Twitter and stuff. Well, here's how you fix this. You change your DNS servers, probably, probably Google's public DNS or somebody else's, something like that, to some other open DNS servers or something like that. You're right, they'll, they'll change that. What else um, you were saying about users you know, on the validation side? How about on the signing side? Should users have to care? Uh, so I think yes and no as well. It's an open question. <laughs> yes. Now we're seeing uh, in countries which have a uh, lot of uh, DNSSEC penetration on the authoritative side, like Sweden, for example. Uh, you see some registers who are throwing some uh, like one-click solution way to enable DNSSEC. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for the end user, is you just have to click something and all your keys are generated for you. A key all over uh, being managed for you. And the register also uploads the DS record to the parent zone. So in this case, it's uh, like entirely transparent for the end user. Cool. And in case you have love for some organization who have more complex needs, so of course they have to be uh, knowledgeable about DNSSEC. And there is a little bit more they have to be concerned about. Are there questions from the audience, by the way? I mean, I'm, I've got a load of questions I can keep asking folks, but Natalia is here with a microphone. If anybody has any questions, you're welcome to ask them. Otherwise, I'm going to keep on going. Well, keep, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, how, do we, how do we accelerate? How do we get more people using DNSSEC? Any answers? Well. I think you sh should do what most Linux distributions do right now. If you install your resolver, for example, Unbound, it just turns on DNSSEC for you, and you don't even see it. That, that's the experience you want. Mm. This is a solution for the experienced users, <laughs> very experienced one. You know. 
Well, but if you install your Windows machine, it should do DNSSEC, or you install your web browser, it should just do DNSSEC for you, and that's how you do real deployment. But for that to happen, there's a lot of work between here and then. Yeah, I, I think I recall, I might have even written about it, that there was a, um, I think one of the BSDs distributions is going to be coming out with, you, you're shaking your head. Uh, yeah, so uh, what Patrick is saying, like uh, Fedora started to uh, bundle like DNS resolver with default configuration, uh, defaulting to validating, okay. to uh, v validation. Uh, I think Debian is uh, thinking about doing this, like the signs yep. are on and they seem to be really interested about DNSSEC. And uh, as we mentioned, like the next, uh, the upcoming FreeBSD 10, we That's have, uh, they are uh, changing the, the default uh, installation to bundle uh, unbound uh, instead of bind and uh, to configure uh, unbound to validate by default. So we'll have the, the, at least those operating systems. Now, I mean, to your point, that is more of the experienced users. It's not my mother or people like that quite yet. But if we can you know, see that start to move out there, that at least works on one part of that. What else can we do? What can we do on the signing side? I know you. <laughs> As a TLD, you can make it cheaper, of course. <laughs> uh, but, but it's really hard to convince the, the government agencies and the banks to actually do the NSEC because it will be much higher cost to them than to a registrar, of mm. course, because they only have a few domains and, and they probably want to invest in HSMs and the security surrounding it as well. Do you need an HSM to sign your domain? Absolutely not. Absolutely but not. <laughs> yeah. But, but if, if you're a TLD, you probably have, uh, you're up higher in the hierarchy where you protect a lot of domains under right. you. So that's the reason why TLDs do it. Yeah, it all depends on your level of risk, right? You know, whether you're just, you know, an independent with a couple domains you want to sign or a smaller company, or if you're, like you said, a TLD that has a very large number or a large enterprise or something on that line. But the, if the only thing you protect is your email, then probably not important with the nation. Other, um, any other comments here? Okay, questions? Um, we've got network operators here. What should they do when they go back? What would you suggest for them to do? Any suggestions? Take a piece of DNS software and try to sign, uh, for example, some zone. Take home. a piece of DNS. And yes, exactly. To play with the DNS mm -hmm. and, and feel and see it, it, it's not uh, difficult. So, uh, it's not a, a two-headed beast. <laughs> it's not a two-headed beast. Yeah, they are We're slaying uh, dragon that slayers. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Antonon validation, of course, in their resolvers, because they are, large operators have a large resolver for, I mean, basically all their customers mm -hmm. that they recommend them to use. Anything? Any thoughts for you? Uh, no, nothing really to add. Like, it makes sense to accelerate development on the resolving side because like, if nobody is validating, there is no sense in having uh, signs on. So. Right, right. And I think the, I mean, one of the things we've seen, what's an interesting effect of Google having signed their public DNS was that we had a number of op people at operators who contacted us and said, you know, the good thing was that Google did this. So it provided them some ammunition to say, well, if Google can figure out how to do it, we ought to be able to do it. You know, I mean, it was because they were getting pushback saying, well, nobody's really doing this. Well, now you could say, well, you know, Google did this for the public DNS. So it's at least something on that line. And I think as we start to see more examples of more countries and more large ISPs and stuff do that, it will continue to go. Your point is right, too. I, I could say it, there's a great white paper that the folks at SurfNet in the Netherlands put out that talks about validation, and they show on the last page how easy it is to implement it in some of the, the validating resolvers, like Unbound and Microsoft uh, Windows Server and stuff. And in some cases, it's just one line of code. I mean, it's, it's one thing in a configuration file. That's it. Go in there and change it. Change it from no to yes, or true to false, or whichever the option is, and, and boom, you're, you're now doing a validating resolver. Oh, Marcin's got his microphone. There we go. Hi. Um, my remark would be like, uh, I'm afraid of protocols without the user interface. It's a the problem we mentioned about uh, if validation fails, how to tell. I think SSL in the old days uh, got really off because of that little padlock in Netscape and this annoying pop-up when you have submitted the form. And that was why SSL, because otherwise uh, I would imagine we would be promoting SSL today. 
But the question is, do you think, do you know any efforts of combining DNSSEC also with spam and mail abuse fighting things? Because for example, what Google Mail is doing, they now report uh, if your uh, email is, has proper DKIM signature, then you, you can check it and you can see that, that somebody signed the headers of any email. Uh, do you think that, that vendors uh, or uh, providers of email should, should work on this and include also DNSSEC? It's a natural extension of, of DKIM, I would say, uh, to promote DNSSEC this way. Yep, a any of you wanna? You know yeah, I've, I've seen a couple of smaller projects looking at how to verify email using DNSSEC and DKIM and stuff like that, uh, mostly within the Internet2 project, but they also include uh, some sort of picture in your email program show you that the validation has been done. I don't remember the exact details, but and, and I, I, I haven't seen any positive results from those projects either. So. There, is a, there are a couple drafts that have come out, um, internet drafts in the, within the Internet Engineering Task Force that are around this topic. Um, at the last, one of the last meetings, um, Russ Mundy was from, who works in some of these DNSSEC areas, was looking at one that was involved with some of the mechanisms for using it in SMTP. So there is some work happening out there in the standard side to look at how it could be used to help protect the, the email in, in environment. And, and, some of that is understanding who you're connecting to. Some of it is, is understanding who you're getting the certificate back from. If you look at it in the Dane environment, you know, if you're using Start TLS and some of the components to go and, and create an encrypted connection for, uh, for email, you could use Dane and the extra protection there to provide an extra layer. So there are people looking at that. Question over there. Hi, um, Matt Moorcroft. Uh, given what Marcin was just saying about not having a user interface and users not understanding why they would get failure if, if uh, we, we can't validate DNS. Um, should we be running resolvers anymore? Should we, in fact, just push this down to the end user PCs or uh, computers? They all are extremely powerful these days. DNS is becoming uh, more frequently more dynamic. Are we buying anything by having resolvers at all? I can answer that. I think the secure validation of DNSSEC should be done as close to the users as possible. So if you want to have a resolver in your home, that's better than having it at the ISP because the distance is much higher. But for the question about the user interface part of it, that was a very conscious decision for the DNSSEC protocol because what you learn from SSL is that people absolutely click on the OK button to just access to your web page. That is not for the benefit of the user, that actually makes it more vulnerable. And I think that... W a, lot of what, a lot of what the problem we, you know, you see uh, when people's computers get rooted and, and taken over by, by various malware is that, you know, it doesn't really matter if the resolver's actually checking and that everything is good. If your computer is not actually aware of what's going on, if you're, if you, even if you yourself just click on randomly, yes, that's fine. At least the user knows something's got, something's up. I guess. I mean, I, I've run resolvers in the past at, at, at previous companies and so on, and I just do, do we need them anymore? Uh, is there a point? I don't think not securing all of the protocols that you use on the internet is an excuse for not having a secure box. And, and I think the, the reality, right, is that DNSSEC is just part of, uh, you know, your overall security strategy. Sure. It solves that issue of making sure that you get, you know, the, the IP addresses you get back are the correct ones. But my, my point is that it's not valid, like, nothing, valid, nothing is seeming to validate from the computer to the resolver. Mm. And, and so, well, what, 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 you know, if something in that path, how do, I don't, val I can't validate my resolver is good. Right. So we're not, you know, we're doing all this lovely work to validate that it's good to the resolver. So what? Well, but, the, uh, but, but to your point, I mean, you can bring that resolver down into the operating system that's yeah. running here. Like we've well, we heard about some of the, the Linux and the BSD side. And, you know, or you can run your own. I run my own unbound resolver on my own laptop. And, that, and that's my point. Should we be running resolvers as, at an ISP level at all? 
Oh, yeah, at an ISP level. Um, and that's a good question. And I think what we're seeing right now is we're seeing the initial deployment out at ISP level and other levels. What I hope we'll see is we'll see further bringing that down into enterprises and the homes. I think Patrick's note about some of what's happening in the home networking environment. People are looking at some of those, the home net, hip net, some of the pieces that are out there, looking at how do we bring that down into the consumer electronics equipment, you know, and, and getting it down into your home router. And that's a good step. And then you could look at how do you even bring it further down into the operating system or even into the applications. You know, and, and people can do it in, in all of those places. Good question. So we're kind of coming up on the end of our session. So let me ask you as far as uh, any final thoughts you want to tell to people out here as far as what they should do to get started with DNSSEC. I don't think there's any excuses left for not doing DNSSEC. But, but <laughs> I like that. For, for deploying it in your home, it, it's still a rough ride. <laughs> but do it on your you know, corporate network. At least. Do it on your corporate network. Yeah. From my per 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 perspective, it's better to do it now than later. When, you know, when people will be more DNSSEC aware and if we do, there, there, there will be more side uh, dom domain names. If something go wrong, then you know the, the impact will be much, much, much higher and painful. So learn it now before it gets yes. so widespread. It's exactly. a good example, good thing for operators to think about. Uh, yeah, I think it's good advice uh, because if you make mistakes now, yeah, once we like at the moment we don't have a lot of uh, people validating yet. So I mean, you can get around this. You can learn from the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, it's especially important for key all over. I mean, yeah. once everyone is validating, like you cannot afford to make this kind of errors, exactly. so you better prepare for them. Sounds good. Well, on that note, let me just wrap with a couple final little slides. One is a map that you can get from our Deploy360 site that shows the top level domains that have signed, and <laughs> you're missing the borders. So over here is Africa. Okay, it looks nice on my slide, but the gray doesn't translate up there. But um, the, uh, this shows the, the top level domains. You can see a lot of the world has signed. A lot of the CCTLDs, almost all of the, the generic top level domains, and all the new GTLDs, the new generic top level domains that are being, that, well, that ICANN is going through this process of rolling out, those all will have DNSSEC as part of it by default. They're, that'll be part of it that's there. So there's a lot of action happening on that. I'll leave you with some resources. This is one of the topics we cover at Deploy360. So if you go to our website and go to internetsociety.org slash deploy360 slash DNSSEC, and if you go right to the basics page, you'll find some good information to get started that are on there. We also do have a page up about this thing called Dane, which is this way of putting SSL certificates into DNS and using them for the web, for email, for VoIP, for IM, for other different tools that are out there. So maybe there, and I mentioned here, again, there's a great, this white paper from SurfNet is really good about the validating side, the resolver side. So as network operators, it's something you can take a look at and see what's there. There's a good long uh, DNSSEC how-to, which is a pretty comprehensive document that gets into this. And also the, uh, the NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, wrote up a document called Secure DNS Deployment Guide, which is guidance for, it's for US federal agencies about how to go and do it, but it's actually a really solid document for anyone to, talk, to look at how do you go and securely deploy DNS in those types of things. So I'll end with um, three steps. I would encourage you, as we said here, deploy some D DNS uh, SEC validating resolvers. Sign your domains if you can. And also, if you're at an operator level, if you can look at how you can help talk about this thing called Dane, it's, uh, it's one of the ways that people are looking at how we can really use this. From a Deploy360 program, um, we also are looking for people who have deployed DNSSEC. We'd like to do some case studies and some um, discussions and documents with you if you've been doing this type of thing. So I would like to just ask you to join me, please, in thanking our panelists for today. And with that, I'm going to bring up Natalia to tell us a little bit about our break we're about to have. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your discussion panel. I would like just to remind you about our after party tonight. Uh, don't be late. It will start at 8.30 in Nipomice Castle. And uh, don't forget about uh, transport because we've got buses for you and the schedule of buses you can find inside your agenda. 
And what else? What else? Uh, there are many challenges waiting for you. And if you have any questions, suggestions, whatever, you, will, you would just like to ask about buses uh, or whatever you want. Just uh, find somebody with staff or organizer. We are here to help you. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll, for the folks who are watching on the live stream, we're going to be going into a break right now. It's 3.30 here in the afternoon. We'll be re resuming at 3.50. So come back in 20 minutes and you'll see us all here. And we're, we're starting up with... Uh, Sonder talking about IPv6 and what's happening around the world with that. So please come. Thank you very much. <laughs>